Hello and welcome to the 12th episode of Karl Marx's 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Friday the 11th of September 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We finish our discussion of Chapter 4, The Rise of Louis Bonaparte. This week I have the new patron, Frederick Vahein, to thank. If you like the sound of extra patron-only episodes and live streams, you too can sign up for only $5 a month. Okay, let's rejoin the discussion. I mean, this this part, it's... It's really just the Montaigne recapitulating the same failures again, right? You know, they had a strength in Parliament, they pissed it away. They got some more strength in Parliament, they pissed it away again. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of pissing going on here today. So we had somebody He's spitting. eating it up and there's pissing. And that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the eating whole thing here. Yeah, that's the yeah. chapter in, in three words. It's a very scatological <laughs> chapter, but it's like one of those 1970s novels, you know, that's like <laughs> super erudite and then someone shits in someone's mouth, you know, like. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. It's a Michel Hollebeck novel. What, what, I was one, thinking more of Thomas Pynchon, but yeah. So what, what other thing here is, maybe I mentioned it before in this season is like, in this in this series is the, the opening scene of the first episode of Boardwalk Empire where Steve Buscemi character is playing a, a liquor running politician who's basically running the, the, the drink game during the depression in Atlantic City. And he was in front of one of these like abstinence meetings with these women. And he stood up in front of a hall full of all these women wanting to ban alcohol, you know, being against alcohol. And he was there and he was giving it all the all the spiel about how, yeah, this is you know, alcohol is terrible, terrible. And he shakes all their hands and donates money to them and goes around the back door. You know, he walks down the street, goes in, meets the boys, goes, oh yeah, we got 4,000 a bottle of whiskey in the boss. And you're like, yeah, yeah, great. And it's like, like that shit, like people can watch that. What it gets me is that people will watch that on the telly. They'll watch it and they go, oh yeah, like, yeah, fuck it. Yeah, that's totally normal. And then I'd say it to like my father or something, and I'd say, "You see that guy there, <laughs> the head of like the party you support? That's exactly what he's doing." And he'd say, "Oh, you're very cynical." <laughs> right, right, right. It's like I wish people could be as cynical as they possibly could, or at least have some level of of, of applying their common sense when they watch a film. It's like you know when you're watching The Matrix, right? You know that the guy who plays um. You know the guy in Sopranos who plays the character that Tony ends up he kills he kills Tony Soprano's horse, the fellow with the wig. Tony kills him and they have a fight in the kitchen and Tony kills him. Is anybody spoilers, people? But anyway, anyway, he's he's the character in, in is the one that betrays them in the Matrix. Uh, yeah, I, I know the guy you're talking about from the Matrix, of course. Yeah, yeah, it tastes really good. I don't care if it's a fake steak. Exactly, yeah, that's the guy. Yeah, that's the guy, right? And when everybody is watching it in the cinema, they go, that piece of shit. He's betraying everybody. Right? Not and, like that. Not like and like that. everybody who's watching it in real life fucking betrays the working class. <laughs> it's the fucking truth of it. All these people sitting down watching, uh, they're all fucking eating the steak. Everybody watching that film is eating the fucking steak. Uh, sorry, I had to say that. I've been meaning to say this for a long time. I mean... Yeah, I, know. I think especially if you take the, you know, the trans reading of the Matrix, that is the, you know, authorial intent. That is also very true. If, if put, being put out in the year 1999. I saw today on Twitter that Neo's, what's his name? Uh, what was his name? Mr. Mr. Anderson on his passport at the expiry date was the 11th of September, 2001. <laughs> oh, Tets. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Right. Who wants to go here? Okay. We have seen how during March and April, the Democratic leaders had done everything to embroil the people of Paris in a sham fight. How after May 8th, they did everything to restrain them from a real fight. In addition to this, we must not forget that the year 1850 was one of the most splendid years of industrial and commercial prosperity, and the Paris proletariat was therefore fully employed. But the election law of May 31st, 1850, excluded it from any participation in political power. It cut the proletariat off from the very arena of the struggle. 
It threw the workers back into the position of pariahs, which they had occupied before the February Revolution. By letting themselves be led by the Democrats in the face of such an event and forgetting the revolutionary interests of their class for a momentary case and comfort, they renounced the honor of being a conquering power, surrendered to their fate, proved that the defeat of June 1848 had put them out of the fight for years and that the historical process would for the present again have to go on over their heads. As for the petty bourgeois democracy, which on June 13 had cried, but if once universal suffrage is attacked, then we'll show them. It had now consoled itself with the contention that the counter-revolutionary blow which had struck it was no blow, and the law of May 31st, no law. On the second Sunday in May 1852, every Frenchman would appear at the polling place with ballot in one hand and sword in the other. With this prophecy, it rested content. Lastly, the army was disciplined by its superior officers for the elections of March and April 1850, just as it had been disciplined for those of May 28, 1849. This time, however, it said decidedly, the revolution shall not dupe us a third time. So yes, the, the army uh, occasionally voted in the revolutionary direction, but those who did so were disciplined. What, what do we think about this sentence here? It cut the proletariat off from the very arena of the struggle. That's an interesting sentence. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's because this is, a, this is a, a political text. It excluded it from any participation in political power. So, right? Like, let's think about, like, what, so what is this election law? They, they basically, they said you had to live three years in the same place. And if you're a worker, you had to get your boss to sign off on it. On, yeah. So you're, you're, you're basically, if you're yeah. a radical worker, you wouldn't get signed off. But so like, so what I'm trying to get at here is that Marx is making a case for the political realm as a place for struggle for social change. It, you know, he's not an anarchist in saying, well, the vote doesn't matter here. He's saying that it is an arena for a struggle. It's not the arena, but it is an, an arena. Well, it says he says the very arena of the struggle, but like yeah, I think but again, the, the political put, struggle. Exactly, but he yeah. what? Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is that he put in a lot of emphasis on the on politics as an area of struggle, as opposed to just purely social. Yeah, it, I mean, this had a really this had a big importance to Marx because Marx believed that democracy and capitalism were essentially incompatible. That was sort of a common sense at the time that if you gave everyone the vote if you actually did universal citizenship like the french revolution was gesturing at that you would have mob rule and class warfare and it wasn't until the 20th century with the bolshevization civil war kind of tendency becoming bringing out the anti-democratic side of marxism that marx does have bits where he's trying to gesture beyond democracy so he postures as being against it that you know marx's position is out of our time essentially you know the achievement of universal suffrage de jour not not really you know de facto because yeah there's a like there's voter there's a lot of ways to do vote suppression but even if you had perfect voting parity in the existing systems that we have you could imagine it coinciding with bourgeois capitalist rule well i i think in america there are a lot of sort of the jacobin crowd who still kind of hold to marx's line there right that right universal suffrage does not exist and it, if it did we would have a workers republic that the political cannot admit actual full universal suffrage without voter suppression is just is just not compatible. There are counterexamples, I think. There are enough counterexamples. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm just yeah. saying, like, this is, in a sense, a living tradition in America Absolutely. because of the peculiarities of American politics. Well, all American progressives think this way, and they actually think so for a very good reason, is that whenever you do polling on policy... You see 
mostly progressive majorities, even like, you know, really like 70% majorities, like on progressive issues. But then you, when you look at the actual expression in institutions, you have a very different picture. It's much more conservative and reactionary. What's not being done, of course, is the institutional analysis and that, hey, read the fucking Federalist. This is ex- these ex- institutions are designed explicitly to curb class conflict. They didn't do so in exactly the way that the founders and you know Hamilton intended, because most people don't really give a shit about local politics, and that's not why things the system mitigates class conflict. But the the very DNA of the country is mitigation of class conflict like mitigation of democracy breaking out, even though there were all these reforms, that is still very much operational. That is still very like the fundamental condition of the system. I, I've seen interviews with like like numerous conservative, like think tank types, you know, economist types. And they say, well, you know, I don't know if I'm a, call myself a Democrat because, you know, if, you know, this, this is, like Marx's analysis is like, well, if 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 everybody has the vote and they, they can just vote to take away my stuff, you know, like they will explicitly come out. There are like not 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 a small number of of bourgeois and petty bourgeois who will actually say that they're only in favor of it such that it's in their interest. As we can see, this whole goddamn book is about. Yeah, I mean, I think in America that sort of anti-democratic line is bolstered by this kind of patina of like founder worship and patri- and like constitutional patriotism where it's maybe more acceptable to, to say that. Whereas in, in other countries you might think that, but you're probably not going to come out and say it on the regular. I have a question for you, Kyle. You know, you're in a suburb there in like, where, what's this, what city are you in again? You're in Alberta. I, I'm not. I'm not in a suburb. I'm in. I'm in the city center. But okay. I, so I, you, I, I'm in. Yeah, I'm in Calgary. Yeah. Say so you're in Calgary and you're driving around. Like, do people yeah. have Canadian flags flying on yeah. the flagpole outside their house? Especially in Alberta, yeah. Which is like, r- ironic because of like all the the separatist stuff. It's just Texas, you know. It's Texas. Wow. Uh, but it's that whole dynamic. But yes, absolutely. You see Canadian flags flying around. Because America is like literally the only country in the world. I've been to Canada, but I've only there for a day or two a few times. So I didn't really get out to the suburbs. But like America is literally the only country in the world I'd be where flags fly like that. If somebody had a flag. Monaco, excuse me. (laughs) I haven't been to Monaco. I haven't. (laughs) No, there are places, but you know, US is uh, still the biggest empire. So of course, seriously, we fly the Roman flag. You don't find like seriously. There's, I don't think there is a European country that flies flags like America. I seriously Euro- European. That. You're probably right. I, I'm not in mean, Africa, except Monaco again. Not not in Asia that I've been to. Like yeah, I mean, you really don't. I don't know. You South really America. Don't. I was in all of South America. There was none. Like literally, it's very very strange. It's you know like you you be like you're probably when you grow up in it you probably don't know it, but it's like to Europeans it's like. Like if you flew a flag in Ireland, basically what people think is that you're in the IRA. That's that's literally what it means. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird. But there's a very different like thing about nationalism here, although it is getting a little more European, where people are more skeptical of expressions of patriotism. But I mean, it's the, it's extre- extraordinarily relative to you know when I was younger and I had red, white, and blue braces. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. I'd say Canadians are almost that patriotic, but but not quite. Not quite. We're number one, baby. Never yeah. let the world forget it, you know? <laughs> I picked up breakfast this morning as a treat, and I drove across a bridge that used to have and, you know, would often have, like, all, like all of the flags of the world, like, kind of lined up against it to the point where I have a picture of myself with a North Korean flag. Um <laughs> near a Starbucks in like a bougie area because they had like a, a UN flag display kind of thing. But right now, because it's getting closer to July, every single one of them has been replaced with an American flag. (laughs) That's what, that's when the true colors come out. Hell yeah. Yeah. So I could go to the same place that in Westport, Connecticut, they're flying a North Korean flag. 
I can go there. And now they're flying an American flag in the same place. And, the, and you know what? They'll probably, after 4th of July and summer is over, replace it with the North Korean flag. Yep. There you go. As as the chat has been gesturing to, let's not forget the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah, that is insane. Mm. That is insane. Mm. Like, now, speaking of North Korea, that is some crazy shit. It reminds me a lot of like the imperial rescript on education, which was like the ultra reactionary conservative education uh, policy that came in in Japan prior to sort of the World War II era. And is like, you know, yeah, I mean, even today, teachers in, in, in Japan are extremely like, I don't know, in general, as a, as a corporate body are quite anti-nationalist as a reaction against that. Flying the Japanese flag at a school is like, holy shit, controversial. In Ireland, like, n- not very many people speak Gaelic. Like, we all learn it in school and all that, but there's only like 50,000 people, native speakers, really left, or something like that. But, uh, like, near when there was land reform in the 1930s after the revolution, there was n- near where I come from, a few miles away, there was a whole load of land from some lord that they redistributed to. Basically, people from the west of Ireland, a Gaeltacht area, where all these like Irish speakers came over in the 1930s and they gave them all farms for nothing. But out there, it's like they have like a school where you can go. And now it's actually getting it's actually getting quite common now for schools to be all through Irish. But back then it wasn't. And there was a Gaeltacht school and you could go there. A friend of mine went there and they had they would have literally it was like America. They'd have the flag. They'd all have to stand outside the flag and sing the national anthem. But like, I mean, in a really IRA way. That when there was a number of like IRA guys on the run in the 80s when I was a kid that done kidnappings and stuff, and literally loads of them stayed in Rakharn in that in, in that like tiny 50 houses or 100 houses. Like the amount of terrorists that went through that place was phenomenal. It's like, uh, yeah, like, and, and the fellow I worked with, he got caught, he lived out there, he got caught with the biggest arms find in on land arms find in in irish history at the time it was one of the gaddafi things from uh gaddafi sent over the only flamethrower ever discovered fucking hell anti-tanks madness anyway we got one we got one paragraph left esri let's hit the final one let's do it the law of may 31st 1850 was the coup d'etat of the bourgeoisie all its conquests over the revolution hitherto had only a provisional character and were endangered as soon as the existing National Assembly retired from the stage. They depended on the hazards of a new general election and the history of elections since 1848 irrefutably proved that the bourgeoisie's moral sway over the mass of people was lost in the same measure as its actual domination developed. On March 10th, universal suffrage declared itself directly against the domination of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie answered by outlawing universal suffrage. The law of May 31st was therefore one of the necessities of the class struggle. On the other hand, the constitution required a minimum of 2 million votes to make an election of the president of the Republic valid. If none of the candidates for the presidency received this minimum, the National Assembly was to choose the president from among the three candidates to whom the largest number of votes would fall. At the time when the Constituent Assembly made this law, 10 million electors were registered on the rolls of voters. In its view, therefore, a fifth of the people entitled to vote was sufficient to make the presidential election valid. The law of May 31st struck at least 3 million votes off the electoral rolls, reduced the number of people entitled to vote to 7 million, and nevertheless retained the legal minimum of 2 million for the presidential election. It therefore raised the legal minimum from a fifth to nearly a third of the effective votes. That is, it did everything to smuggle the election of the president out of the hands of the people and into the hands of the National Assembly. Thus, through the electoral law of May 31st, the party of order seems to have made its rule doubly secure. By surrendering the election of the National Assembly and that of the president of the republic, to the stationary section of society. Seemed. Well, all is an important word with Marx. So many misreadings of Marx can be attributed to the way that he throws his voice and says, you know, this is what it looked like. 
so when he says stationary section of society, what does he mean there? The non-revolutionary. Yeah. I, I, I think it really just means like they're inert. They're not like progressive. Like they, they're not they have movement. no historical motive force to them. This is get back. Yeah. It gets back to the kind of key yeah. point on legalism again, isn't it? This yeah, is the taking of legalism for political power and yep. universal suffrage and its role in you know the class character of a political formation. What Marx is saying here is that the necessity of class struggle meant the bourgeoisie getting rid of universal suffrage, the bourgeoisie getting rid of domination of the bourgeoisie. Again, universal suffrage still here associated with domination of the, by the bourgeoisie, right? Like, are, are we sure about that? Because it says the history of elections since 1848 had irrefutably proved that the bourgeoisie's moral sway over the mass of people was lost in the same measure as its actual domination developed. Yeah, fair. But I guess this is a, like a, a changing point in the system, right? Mm. Like at first in the, again, I'm going to use these terms. We might object to this, but you know, in the heroic phase of the bourgeoisie, it and universal suffrage kind of went hand in hand because it, it had the moral sway of the people. Right. And so, you know, after this point, when it loses moral sway with the people, then universal suffrage and bourgeois dominance. So that's, you know, it's, it's a good qualifying point. Like it's not, it's not in lockstep. Marx is kind of, pointing to something that differs here. Yeah, but because I, the universal suffrage was actually brought about by the proletariat in 1848 and not really what the, yeah, the right, bourgeois right, right. leaders wanted. No, that, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. Universal suffrage here is still like a good to Marx, something that he assumes would have to happen in order for there to be class struggle. Isn't it an assumption that, like, do you not, do you need it for class struggle? Because they had class struggle before. I, came in. I don't think you need it for class struggle, you need, but you I need think the proletariat I, to win the class struggle. That's what you need it for, for in Marx's, like, theory of, in, you know, anything Marx sketches out in the transition to communism. It's through, like, you know, the proletariat winning universal suffrage and winning, like, labor rights and then wielding these rights in society, you know, against the society. Right, like basically making the social republic in that sense, like universal suffrage and therefore like numerical superiority establishing the the dictatorship of the proletariat. Yeah, and inevitably you'll be attacked by the bourgeoisie. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I think your your basic point there kind of stands, right? That like the seeming like kind of like failure of this formula is where you get like Frankfurt school stuff. Right. Explain that. Like once you have universal suffrage achieved in many capitalist countries and it does not lead to the dictatorship of the proletariat, that's when you get critical theory, Frankfurt school, like a responses and trying to understand why the motor of social progress has been sabotaged or has self-sabotaged. The power of ideology over material mm. conditions. Yeah, like, it, to me, it's quite interesting. Like, when was this uh, idea really start to become to the fore of, you know, that Frankfurt School analysis? What years are we talking about? Uh, really comes to the fore in the early 60s. When was the stuff written? Oh, it was. It was started. It started to be written in like the late forties. It's something that people say about the ideology stuff, and you know there is something to be said for for it to me. But like, I don't know what what your experiences is or are when you tell somebody you're a communist. Like invariably, when I say they're communist, and people, the first thing they'll say like, "Well, like Stalin." Well, but it, and that's, that's, to me, that's the dominant thing over ideology. It's the experience uh, of what happens. That's that's my my instinct. Oh, oh, okay. No, no, no. That's that's a good point. Yeah, because most people are thinking that you're staking out and your ideology. You're not Correct. like thinking about like any broader social forces that you know. I like mustaches and gulags or something. Yeah, like, and I think that 
it, it kind of makes sense from a, a practical person, a practical point of view analysis, like a material analysis, why people, why the proletariat have gone a certain way right now, because they've seen the first instance of it hasn't worked out very well. And so there's a reticence to go there again. I think it might take a whole couple of generations of people to for that to become like talking about you know, maybe like, you, you know, when people say, oh, yeah, well, what about Cromwell? You know, Irish people remember him, but no one else remembers a fucking goddamn thing about him. You know what I mean? That it might take that thing whereby that lived memory of what that experience was fades. I, I think the, the power of ideology might be overrated. Who knows? To be fair to the Frankfurt School, like they also had an analysis of the Soviet Union and why it was not a good thing. Like they, they they weren't saying like oh shit why didn't the proletariat go over to the Soviet side that wasn't the that wasn't their critique. You're Just right. Going. We flew we flew away from what's being said here. This is about you know voter disenfranchisement being led by the bourgeoisie that traditionally would have been for voter enfranchisement. It's about that limit within liberalism where they're not actually for universal suffrage not even for you know, like universal man suffrage you know what i mean there are, there's simply like limits i'm in france like universal suffrage was universal man suffrage even in the french revolution is that wrong that's correct it's it's okay. universal man suffrage so like universal suffrage here is you know not yet actually universal suffrage but again maybe the way that you retain marx's kind of political framework from here is to say, well, what we consider universal suffrage, you know, far ex as expanded and, you know, the bourgeoisie keep doing voter suppression and, you know, ways to define people out of being able to vote, which, you know, if this is true and there's a lot of like electoral like manipulation and, you know, gerrymandering where they make like, you know, ethnic districts or, you know, clump people together so that one ethnicity can't like actually be represented in its areas or something there, you know, there are a lot of like vote suppression things that are operative. It's an, I guess an open question that if these things were fixed, how left or, you know, how different would representation be in, I mean, you know, the United States is an obvious example. Like it is an open question, you know, how far would it go? How much would it change? I don't even think it would change that much. Like if you take like a modern European state where they have full suffrage versus say America, you have a lot of voter suppression and stuff like that and gerrymandering. Like say somewhere like Ireland, it's pretty, it's not really done like that. You know, there's not weird boundaries so that people can get disenfranchised and stuff like that. It's pretty right. properly bourgeois run. But like the but only I, ever Ireland is quite different than the United States, you know, and um, you can't always... Oh, I know. Yeah, Re reason by analogy, you know. No, that like... wasn't. That was my point. The point was I was going to say was like that. Like, even if, like, say you have one that's won reasonably well for a bourgeois state, right? Like, say Ireland or even England's won pretty well, right? That you still don't get like a hundred percent voting turnout. You only get like. 65 70 and in america you're getting 55 so it would only be a 10 percent probable difference anyway you know what i mean that's just the reality of the thing and the the voter participation has been declining ever since the 70s right so it it's there's something else going on that is not simply like active voter suppression that is is leading to uh apathy towards the political Right. Yeah, I think it's like I think it's the public, you know, like this a very normal thing you hear people say. Actually, they're all the same. That's what people say in Ireland. The politics. Who are you going to vote for? You go. Actually, they're all the same. And like they 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 mean it. Like and they're kind of right in the sense that like they're just politicos. They you know like there's not much fucking difference between any of them. You don't have this divide of oh like these are actual socialists and these are actual capitalists they're all uh, just a, a, a blamange you know of nothingness <laughs> is that french for blob i don't know what it means I, I sometimes i say these words and it could mean like you know trousers or something let me see <laughs> blamange. again there's there's a sort of left communist theory of, of decadence that the dynamics marx was talking about had like a sell-by date and we're past that 
you know, often you'll get like 1914 as the moment of decadence. If you look at something like, you know, communization, a lot of that stuff might say the break was in the seventies. If they are courteous enough to give, you know, each wave of Marxism, it's time period where it fit its place in its particular cycle of struggle or what have you. Because others are just like, nah, she was just always wrong. Let's face it. Blancmange is actually a dessert. I don't know why the hell I. I, I it's. Uh, I don't know what word I'm looking for. To so tasty. Oh. Decadence is, is decadent is, in two senses. Oh, of the word. yes. Decadence. <laughs> <laughs> it's like me trying to show off using like a French word that's totally out of context. They're just like a dessert, they're like yeah. a creamy dessert. Maybe that's why we don't get French listeners, actually. <laughs> What's going on right now with universal suffrage and political inertness is a bit of an open question. I mean, we, I think we all know that like people are being shut out of the political in some way or another, but there's also a lot of apathy going on. And we've seen from like the Bloomberg failure that it's not simply a matter of people just buying their way into politics. So that's right. There's something going on. What Marx suggested about universal suffrage was clearly not a hundred percent correct. We need to think about that. But you know, he did do a pretty good description of the dynamic at his time. Yeah. So here yeah. we have it. We've got all the way. They pissed it away the second time. The party of order have thinking they've nailed down Bonaparte. They think he was weak. They the got Jesuits their, are back. The Jesuits <laughs> are back. The wine is expensive. You have to go to mass. God damn it. I went to mass every morning at half seven in a Catholic boarding school for five oh, years. Christ. I'm telling you. I, I, I feel it for the French here. I feel it for them. We had no wine. Unless you're stealing the wine from the sacristy, which my, myself and my mate did. We used to water down <laughs> the wine from the sacristy. That was good. <laughs> it's nice. all coming out now. Get ripped on church wine. Yeah, it was nasty. I must say, it was nasty. I came back. I, 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 I have a story for you. I was a or- church organist, and I played in a, in a <laughs> competition in Dublin, and I came second, and I was really pissed off. So myself and my mate, he was turning the pages for me that day, and we went on the piss. So we we're only like sixteen. We found some dodgy bar in Dublin. We went in, and I had eight pints of Guinness. Like a lot of Guinness. And it was like only my second time, I think, ever drinking. I had eight pints. You already already drank more than I've ever drank. I have drank 20 pints of Guinness in one night. That's a long time ago. Oh, Lord of mercy. So I went, we came back and I I vomited all over myself on the train on the way home. (laughs) I vomited all over this poor woman who was sitting opposite me. And I vomited on this like... (gasps) My my music that I had like borrowed from the local <laughs> cathedral. Oh, I was no. wearing a suit. I, I had bought puked all over us. Oh, so babe. I, my, when I when I got back, I st- we stumped my mate got me. We stumbled back to like thing. If we were caught drinking, we would have been expelled. So, but I was supposed to be playing the church that night. We had mass <laughs> that night, and I came in, and my my mates. <laughs> smuggled me up into the organ it was upstairs it was like a round it was like a kind of a windy staircase you know a metal staircase up to the to the where the organist plays and I, I i they got me up there and so i was all right i was up there i was kind of sober and i was I played a few of the hymns simple enough and then you normally i play a classical piece or something during communion when it would take a while people to get to communion and so I was, uh, I said, fuck this. I said, I, I lost that day. And this piece I played was this like, it's about 20 minutes long. It's, 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 it's one of Vidor, I think it's Vidor's opening part of Vidor's Sixth Symphony for organ. And I, and it's a, it's a master, it's a blaster of a piece. So I said, fuck this, I'm playing it. So I pull out all the stuff from the fucking organ. And I started playing it and I blow the whole fucking place apart. But not only that, but like the, uh, the, the <laughs> Not only that, but like the piece is like 15, like, I don't know, like 10, 15 minutes long. And like the thing only takes like three minutes. So for like seven minutes, the priest was staring up at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thrashing away. Dun, 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 dun. This like, thing was going on and on. Oh my and, like, God. So I did it and I played the whole thing. And then afterwards, like my mate came up and he, he, uh, he had done some of the singing and he came up and he was like, what the fuck was that? And I was like, he saw that I was like all over the place drunk. And he was like, 
you know, the priest is going to be waiting for you outside the church. And I was like, fuck. So what we do? So Damn. We, so what we did is we uh, we picked, we, you could lift one of these large pipes out of the organ and you lift it out. He held it and I climbed into the middle of the organ <laughs> and we put the, the pipe back down into it. And the priest was like, the priest, after a while, the whole church had emptied and there was no sign of me coming out. So the priest came up and he came up into the where my mate was up there and he said, uh, where's Mr. O'Brien? And uh, he was like, oh, he went out earlier. And he was like, the priest was like square eyed. He was like, looking at me, he's like, <gasps> like, what the fuck? He's like, how could he have slipped past me? You know, and so basically I stayed there for ages until they like I had a cold shower. They threw me in the showers or something. They sobered, managed to get up and avoid them. So sorry. I, what, what was it? Why was I telling this? Because the know. Jesuits came back. I don't oh, know, yeah. Tom, but that Jesuits. was that was the best story I think you've ever told. So 16-year-old Tom O'Brien is fucking smashed, ripping on a classical organ piece like two, three times over time during the service, and then lays low in an organ pipe because he, he <laughs> threw up on himself <laughs> and others, his self Wasn't- and others. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats.